Today, <laughs> that was such a YouTube -y thing. Listen, I tried to do it. It was too cringe. <laughs> you know, the YouTube -y thing where like, you start recording, you go on the other side of the door, open it up, sit down, pretend like the camera's been <laughs> recording in the room forever. On a side note, and I know, by the way, this is just a very informal vlog because we're out on the road. Uh, I wanted to hop on and teach something, but I know my video editor, Zach, sorry, our video editor, I'm your record, Zach, hates introductions. He hates when there's just fluff. But side note, it reminded me, my least favorite thing, probably my pet peeve of all time, anyone who knows me closely knows that this is like, one of the things I hate so much. I hate going out in public and seeing teenage girls take pictures. Like I, I hate the setup for the pic, like, cause you, you see the finished product on Instagram. They're all like, you know, twirling their hair, but like just watching them take the pictures is so annoying because it's like, they're like, all right, now twirl your hair. It's, it's just so awkward. It's very, it's very frustrating. Um, that's not what I'm going to teach on today. I just, you know, wanted, wanted to get that off my chest. We're in Indiana. Um, it's a beautiful day out. We're, we're on a farm. So uh, I'm feeling very, very Midwest today. Um, it's a beautiful farm, beautiful house. But I wanted to teach this. Today we're talking about the four steps of the formula of faith. Now, automatically, when you say that faith is a formula... You have some people that um, don't like that word. You know, it's it's like a hip thing now to say, and it's like a, it's become a cliche. People saying, preachers saying, I mean, you know, faith isn't a formula. You can't you can't uh, coax God into uh, giving you what you want with the formula of faith. My faith is not a formula; it's a relationship. When I, I understand the sentiment, you know, my faith isn't a formula; it's a relationship. Yes, we have a relationship with God. You know, he's my father. But also, he's laid out steps in the Bible of how to receive everything that he has for us. I mean, even think about salvation. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. Believe plus confess equals salvation. Super simple. That's a formula. That's an equation, okay? So... I really hope that this is going to help some people, no matter what you're believing for, if it's healing, if it's salvation of a family member, uh, if it's for, you know, a whatever it is, any of the, uh, any of the things that God's laid out in his word that are for you require faith. Faith is the access point to everything God's given you. Uh, Ephesians chapter one says it like this. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So th there's no more blessings to be blessed with. He's already healed you. He's already set you free. He's already saved you. He's already uh, blessed you financially. He did all those things 2,000 years ago. So then you have to ask yourself the question, why is it that not every Christian, or why is it that I personally am not walking in everything that he has for me? It's because faith is the access point into what he has for you. So today we're going to go over these four steps of faith, four steps of faith. I'm going to lay them out and then I'm going to go through each of them pretty quickly. So number one, it goes like this. It's very simple, very simple. And you can see it in every story of the Bible where anytime that someone receives something from Jesus, you see all these points, right? First, you hear it. Then you see it. Then you speak it. Then you have it. So it's Hear it, see it, speak it, have it. Hear it, see it, speak it, have it. And you write that in the comments. Take it down in your notes if you're taking notes on this. Um, write in the comments, hear it, see it, speak it, have it. Number one, hear it. I want to cover this. This is the foundation of faith. The Bible says in the book of Romans, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how does faith come? We can't pray for faith. Nowhere in the Bible, you know, it's actually interesting. The, the, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. 
You know what Jesus did? Right now I increase you. No, he didn't even answer the question. He ended around, he didn't end around to their question. So when they asked for more faith, he didn't say, all right, I'm giving you more faith. No, there's only one way to get more faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Now I want to take you to an example. Sorry, getting my Bible here, knocking things over. Um, I want to show you an example in the Bible. We'll go to the book of Acts. Chapter 19. And I want to show you this because this right here perfectly exemplifies how you receive something from God. Acts chapter 19. And we'll read it here. Paul in Ephesus. As it happened that Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Okay, so Paul found believers at Ephesus. Okay, that's what we, we see here. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Listen to their answer. They said, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And Paul said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who is to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they all began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. So you see right there that they couldn't receive the Holy Spirit because they hadn't even heard about him. So is it that God didn't actually pour out the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2? No, he already did. He sent the Holy Spirit to the earth. Uh, the 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began doing work. This is late in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 19. There's already been uh, 17 chapters, 18 chapters of the, the apostles doing work by the power of the Holy Spirit. So how is it that they hadn't received? Because they had not heard. Many people, the reason that they don't have healing or if they don't have prosperity is because nobody's taught it to them. Nobody showed them from the word of God. Another example, this is one of my favorite chapters in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 14. And we'll start uh, in, in verse eight. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. So in the middle of Paul's service that he's having, he's literally preaching to the people. And there's a man sitting right there. And as he's preaching, the man crippled from birth. He had never walked in his life, had no ability to walk, had no muscle mass. It was, it, it was impossible. And the man's listening to Paul preach. Here's what it says. He listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. Where did that man receive the faith for that? This was a village that had never heard of Jesus until Paul got there. So there had to be something about what Paul was saying that in, in the mind of the man, I can even imagine him sitting there thinking, if, the, if what this man is saying is true, then there's no reason that I have to be crippled one more day. And be, immediately, Paul saw the faith that he had, the faith that he had received through the preaching and teaching, and sprang up. So number one, hear it. You have to hear it. This is a, this is a very practical key. Every single day, every day, listen to anointed teaching and preaching. Every day. Don't, don't go a day without ingesting the word of God. It builds your faith. So number one, hear it. Number two, see it. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Everyone goes to this verse on faith because it's a, it's a fantastic definition of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse one. Now faith is, and by the way, this verse used to always confuse me. Always. I never understood it. I never really like even grammatically, I didn't understand how these and any of this went together. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. Let's go to the NLT real quick. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. Here's it in the King James. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
So I, I used to think like faith is the substance of things hoped for, the substance. And I never understood how that went together. But you have to understand that faith puts assurance or it puts a demand on what you hope for. You hear a lot of Christians say, or, or I mean unbelievers too, you hear people say, well, I'm hoping this is going to happen. I, I, I hope you do well. You know, I hope this works out. I hope, I hope. What does that really mean? Hoping. It, it's wishful thinking. It's basically like, well, if I had my way and I could control the universe, I, I'd have this happen. But how many know we can't control everything? Hoping is just wishful thinking. I want something to happen, right? So there's a difference between hope and faith. You can't hope for things. You've got to believe in faith for things. I, uh, I've talked about it on the podcast a little bit, but uh, I, I did a summer this past summer, so I guess a year ago, at this company that all of the people, like without fail, all of the people were what I would call, uh, they were all hype beasts or they were all gym bros, if you know what that means. They were all like, you know, they all had a vape in hand. They were all smashing a bang energy drink. It was like a college frat house every single day. We would go into team meetings. And this company specifically, because it was a sales company, they were very much big into uh, motivational speeches, you know, motivational uh, songs. They would love like motivational speakers. And Every day they would sit us down and at the meeting they would show a motivational speech. And the whole time it it irritated me at my core. Like I I cannot stand, I cannot stand motivational speakers. I can't. It's so grating to me. Because if you think about what motivational speakers are, you know, a guy will come on. It's like, you know, if you put your best in, you're going to get your best out. And they would just start saying stuff like your future is going to change. You know, your future is going to get better. You're going to have everything you want. You know, it's like the the speaker starts saying things that really in my mind, I was thinking, well, how did like, these are unbelievers. How do they know what this man is saying is true? Your life's going to change dramatically. Why? Why? You see, so it's a, it's a wishful thinking. It's, it's hope without substance. There's, there's no guarantee that what that man has said, that my life's going to improve, is true. No guarantee. It's just what he's saying. So it used to bother me because without faith, hope is void. Without faith, your wishful thinking is void. There's no assurance. That's why the Bible says faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's a sign. It's a, it's a signature from the hand of God that the things that you hope for are coming to pass. That's powerful because... Though hope on its own can't do anything, you need to have hope. So what was it? It was number one, it was hear it. You gotta hear uh, the message of it. You gotta hear what God has for you. Number one, hear. Number two, see it. You've got to see yourself healed. You've got to see yourself prosperous. You've got to see yourself free. You know, there's a story in the Bible, uh, Jesus healing blind Bartimaeus. And as Jesus is passing through. He's yelling, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. Because why? Because he hears that Jesus of Nazareth is passing through. And so he then yells, Jesus, have mercy on me. Uh, Jesus, upon hearing him, tells him, bring that man to me. So this is a blind man. I want you to think about this. Think about it in, in like it was happening in front of you. You're in a busy town square. There's this Crazy man, you think, yelling for Jesus. Jesus, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Everyone's telling him to shut up. Shh, shh. You're bothering the man of God. Jesus, bring him to me. He's a blind man, right? He's got a beggar's cloak. He has no money. He's blind. You've got to imagine he's being led, led by the hand because he can't see. Led by the hand of Jesus. Now, the question that Jesus asks is kind of funny. He then asks... What do you want me to do for you? Now, hold up. Does Jesus know that this man's blind? Yes. He is very, if you've ever seen a blind person walk, it's very clear that they're blind. They can't see, you know, they're, they're making their way. So why did Jesus ask that? 
It's because he had to locate that man's faith. He had to say, what, what is it that you are believing for? I can't, I can't force anything onto you. You've got to hope for it. You've got to see yourself healed. And so number one, hear it. Number two, see it. You, you've got to have hope. The moment that you stop believing for big things, your faith is dead in the water. It's crazy because you see people, the number one way to see if people are on fire or not, or they're just coasting through life. If they're not believe, you know, you can ask someone, Hey, what, what's something big you're believing God for? If they don't have an answer, then you can, you already know that their, their relationship with God is stale. If they're, I don't know. I just, because the moment you stop believing for something big, reaching for something that takes faith, your relationship with God, it, it's stale. It's, your faith is dead in the water. You're not, your, your faith is being uh, neglected. All right, number three, four steps to the formula of faith, number three. So it's uh, hear it, see it, speak it, speak it. It is so important. This is so important. We'll go to this verse of scripture. It's so important that you grab this. You could say like, you know, Alex, you, you talked about, you know, hearing it, seeing it, speaking it, having it. You've never talked about believing once. I'll show you why. Because in the Bible, we'll go to Mark 11, chapter 23. Mark 11, 23. Right here. Truly I say to you, he's saying to the disciples, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and be thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. Now, Kenneth Hagin, one of the greatest, I believe the greatest teacher on faith, said it like this, and he read out of the King James Bible, and there's nothing wrong uh, with reading out of the King James, but I want to show it to you in the King James. For verily I say unto you that whoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe the things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. If you notice in that verse, you can count up the amount of times he says the word say and the amount of times he says the word believe. If you count it up, he says say three times and believe one time. So the Lord actually spoke to Kenneth Hagin and said, you're going to have to do three times the amount of teaching on the saying aspect of faith than you do the believing aspect of faith. Why? Because what you say will prove what you believe. What you say will prove what you believe. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever you believe will quickly come out in your voice, will come out in your language, will come out in your speech. So how do we activate faith? It's confession. The power of life and death resides in the tongue. Those who love it will eat of its fruits. If you're believing for something, speak it out. Just like, just like we do for salvation. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. If you just believed in your heart and never confess with your mouth, that's not how you get salvation. You have to confess that Jesus is Lord. In the same way, you have to confess what the word of God says concerning your situation. I confess that I am healed. I confess that I am blessed. Start, start lining your words up with God's words, right? Hear it. See it. Speak it. All right. Here's the last point. Have it. This is the seal of your faith. This is the seal. You've done all three. Now seal it. Have it. Well, you say, Alex, you can't just, you know, have it. That's the easiest part. No, no, no. I want you to understand something. You don't have it when you have it. You have it when you say it. We'll, we'll go back to this verse. Mark eleven twenty three and 24. Truly, I'm reading again because it's so important. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and be thrown into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. Therefore, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Believe that you have received it and it will be yours. 
I heard a young man who did like a, a video on Instagram, uh, just a reel, say this, and it really jumped up I knew, immediately. It, it kind of provoked my spirit. But he said, you know, sometimes we pray for things and God doesn't immediately give it to us because he knows that if we, he gave it to us too soon, it would ruin us. Now, I started to think about that. And I started to think, what? What from the Bible? If God uh, gave it to us too soon, would ruin us. God's thinking like, I'll just, I'm waiting on, I'm waiting on healing this person. Because if I heal them now, it's going to ruin their life. You know, think about that in terms of salvation. I know this person's like crying out to me. He's repenting of sin. He's asking me to save him. He's doing all the things I told him to do, but I'm going to wait because if I saved him right now, he wouldn't learn everything I want him to learn. That is a ridiculous thing to say. Ridiculous. It's stupid because you don't wait because if, if you're waiting to, to physically hold in your hand what you're believing for to then say, I have it. If you can only say, I have what God uh, what I ask God to give me when you have it in your hands, you're walking by sight and not by faith. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. So the moment I ask for something, father in Jesus name, I'm believing for, let's, let's just take it. I'm believing for a promotion at my job. I'm believing for it. Lord, you said that no good thing will you withhold from those that walk uprightly. Lord, I walk up rightly. Just start confessing the word and say, in Jesus' name, amen, I have that promotion. You see, I don't wait until the boss calls me into the office, says you have it, to then say I have it. No, I have it the moment I pray. I really hope this helped you. We'll go over it one more time. Formula of faith. Hear it. See it. Speak it. Have it. Hear it. You've got to hear what God has for you. You've got to be taught and preached to Whatever God has for you, turn on anointed preaching and teaching every day. Listen to Pastor Ted. Listen to Evangelist uh, Ted and Carolyn. Turn on your favorite preacher. Turn on Brother Kenneth Hagan. Turn on someone who who preaches the word and, and builds faith in you. Number two, see it. You've got to see yourself in the position that God has for you. You've got to see yourself healed. You've got to hope for it. There's got to be a wanting to go forward. Number three, speak it. Don't stop saying what God said. Let your words line up with God's words. And number four, have it. The moment you pray, receive it. And there's no question about it afterwards. Don't then go back and say, you know, I, I don't know if I, I have it. You know, I just, I just need to, I, just, I don't know if God heard it. Let me pray one more time. No, the moment I pray, I have it. It's done, right? I just wanted to, I wanted to cover that because it's so important that we understand that. Because you have Christians then say, you know, like, I, I asked God, I guess it just didn't happen. No, there's a way you approach God. God's laid out in his word how you approach him. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next week.